Lesson number 188, Surah Al-Furqan, ayah number 51 to 62. وَلَوْ شِئْنَا And if we had willed, لَبَعَثْنَا Surely we could have sent فِي كُلِّ قَرْيَةٍ Into every city نَذِيرًا A warner. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no shortage of prophets. There is not a nation except that Allah sent a prophet to it. In the Qur'an we learn, وَإِن مِّنْ أُمَّةٍ إِلَّا خَلَى فِيهَا نَذِيرٍ There is not a community except that a warner was sent to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no shortage of prophets. He can send to every city a warner. But the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a messenger to all of mankind. And the reason for this was not because there was a shortage of prophets. So this is why he was one messenger sent to all of mankind and for all time after him and for all places. But the reason was to honor Rasulullah ﷺ with greater reward. Because he was a prophet sent to who? All of mankind, for all places, until the end of time, until the end of this world. And because of that reason, you can say his task was greater. And because the task was greater, the effort would be greater. And because the effort would be greater, the reward would also be greater. Because every other prophet before Muhammad wasallam was sent to who? To who? To their own nation specifically. But the Prophet ﷺ was sent to who? All of mankind. Right? All races, all people, all over the world. And because of that, his effort was also greater. He was given the honor of jihad. Allah says, فَلَا So do not. تُطِعْ You obey. الكافرين, the disbelievers. Do not obey the disbelievers. Meaning when they offer you wealth, when they offer you some other kind of you know, promise or anything, they say, take this and stop conveying your message. Did that happen in Mecca? Many times. When they made many offers to Rasulullah and I'm saying, we'll make you a king. We'll make you a chief. We'll give you this much money. If you want treatment, we'll get you treated. You want this, we'll get you this. Whatever you want, ask for it, we'll give you, but just stop conveying your message. Allah says, فَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ Do not obey these disbelievers. What do you have to do? You have to convey the message to all of mankind, all people. And for that, you have to وَجَاهِدْهُمْ And strive against them. Be he with it. With what? Meaning with that which has come to you. What is it that has come to the Prophet ﷺ? The Qur'an. How is it that you should strive with this Qur'an against your enemy? Jihadan kabira, A striving that is kabir, that is great. Why? Because you have to convey to all people, to all nations, in all places, at all times, until the day of judgment. Therefore, your effort should match your goal. Your efforts should match your goal. Now, the Prophet ﷺ is instructed to do jihad over here. Jihad hum bihi jihadan kabira. What is jihad? Jihad from juhd, from jihad jim hadal, Extreme effort. Extreme effort that a person spares no moment or effort in his striving. No moment. He doesn't spare any moment. He doesn't spare any effort. He does whatever is within his capacity. Maximum effort. Extreme effort. And jihad is not just striving a lot, but it is also at a large scale. Large scale. Not a small effort, but a great effort in which a person uses all of his abilities, all of his resources. Whatever he has at his disposal, he uses it. And thirdly, jihad is to strive at every front, wherever there is a need. Now look, when you look at the meaning of jihad, isn't jihad itself very big? I mean, you're required to exert all of your effort, use all of your resources, Right? Spare no moment. Go at every front, wherever you are called, wherever there is a need, you go there, you respond. This is jihad. But Allah says, jihad and kabira. It should be a great jihad. A great, great striving. With what? With the Quran. How? How do you strive with this Quran? 
What kind of effort is needed over here? What kind of jihad is this? First of all, in receiving it. Because the Prophet ﷺ, for him to receive the Qur'an, was that an easy task? Was that an easy task? Not at all. There are reports in which we learned the Sahaba said the Prophet ﷺ was sitting on a camel, the wahi came, and the legs of the camel, you know, the way the camel was walking, it sounded as if it was going to, the legs of the camel were going to break. It, it, it couldn't continue walking. When it was cold, the Prophet ﷺ, if the wahi would come to him, he would start sweating. Just imagine the fear that the Prophet ﷺ must have experienced when the first wahi came to him. So much so that he thought he was going to die. Something bad was going to happen to him. And Khadija anha had to comfort him. Rasulullah ﷺ. So, so much effort in first of all, receiving the Qur'an, and then not just receiving it, but conveying it also. Reciting it to people, spreading the Qur'an in every corner and part of the world. That was the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He used every way and means to preserve the Qur'an, to pass on the Qur'an, to teach the Qur'an. And this was the goal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is the task that he was entrusted with. That the Qur'an must reach every person. And for that... Exert tireless effort. Don't try once, but try many times. Use different methodologies, different techniques, so that people receive the Qur'an. People hear the word of Allah. How did the Prophet ﷺ perform this task? Very well. So well, that within 23 years, what happened? The face of Arabia was changed. The people who were his opponents, became his subjects now, literally. The situation completely changed. However, what is the ummah supposed to do? The Prophet ﷺ did what he had to. The Sahaba also did what they had to. What are we supposed to do? We just sit with the Qur'an. Not even with the Qur'an, we sit away from the Qur'an. Whereas we are told, جَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا kabira. We really need to see is the Qur'an really a priority for me? Because Allah is instructing His Messenger. And this instruction is also for us. That take this Qur'an and pass it on. This is your weapon against your enemy. This is your weapon against shaitan. This is what you have to take to the world. So we need to see what practical effort am I exerting or am I going to exert to convey the Qur'an? What am I doing to take this Qur'an forward to people? وَهُوَ الَّذِي And he is the one who مَرَجَ He has released From the root letters ميم را جيم مروج مروج is when things get jumbled up when they get mixed up in such a way that each retains its individual state You understand? Like for example if you take a whole different for example beads right? Some are pink some are purple some are blue right? And then you mix them up when you mix them up, you see pink, blue, purple. They're mixed up. But each bead has retained its individual identity. Correct? This is muruj. So Allah is the one who has released so that they can merge, so that they can mix what? Al-Bahrain, the two seas, plural of Bahr. Meaning both the waters are flowing together, next to each other, but both remain what they are. They come together without blending. They come together without losing their respective identities. What are these two waters? Hada, this, meaning one is adbun, fresh. Adbun, adhuba, ain dhalba. Adhuba is when water is sweet, it is pleasant. A person likes to drink it even though he's not thirsty. Has it ever happened with you? That it's not like you're dying out of thirst. It's not like you had something very spicy. But the water is just the right temperature. It's not too cold. It's not warm. It's the right temperature. It doesn't taste like chlorine. All right. So what happens? You feel like drinking it. This is adhuba. Adhub. And adhbun. Furatun. Furat, from the root letters farata, furat is sweet. Farat al ma. Furat is basically water that is extremely pleasant. Alright? Have you heard of the river Euphrates? 
It's called furat in Arabic. Why? Why is it called furat in Arabic? Because it is sweet water, river. You understand? It's river, it's not ocean, it's not sea, it's river. All right? And because of that, the water is pleasant, it's drinkable, it's delicious. And also remember that adbun furatun, together when these words are coming, what do they emphasize? Fresh, sweet, palatable water, easy to drink, not just easy, but you enjoy drinking it. All right? It's delicious to drink. And it's also great in quantity. Adbun furatun, not just a little bit, but a lot of sweet water. Wahada and this one, meaning the other one is milh. It is salty. Ujajun, bitter. Milh, mim lam ha, ujaj, hamza, jim, jim. Milh is very salty. Alright? And it is said that milh particularly refers to that which is salty and also kind of warm. And when you put both of these characteristics together, salty and warm, is it easy to drink it? No way. In fact, when you drink it, will it hurt your throat, your chest? Yes, it'll hurt you. Alright? So this is milh. And ujaj, hamza jim jim, ujaj is further emphasizing milh. Meaning extremely salty, bitter water that you cannot take even a sip of. Have you ever tried drinking seawater? Anybody? How is it? It's very unpleasant. And? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. You want to spit it out. It's not something that you can easily swallow. Correct? And when you do accidentally swallow a sip or two, then what happens? It leaves such a bitter taste in your mouth. You feel horrible afterwards. You need to have something cool to get rid of that bad taste. To get rid of that bitter feeling in your throat, in your chest. So this is milhun ujaj. So bitter that you cannot drink it. No matter how thirsty you are, you're not going to drink it. Because it's only going to make you more thirsty. So these are the two waters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has released both of these waters together. So there are many places where both the two waters are coming together. They're flowing simultaneously. What happens when sweet water joins salty water. So for example, a river, it ends up in the sea or in the ocean. What happens? What happens? Usually the salty water, it will go to the bottom and the sweet water will come to the top. And eventually, after a long period of time, they will eventually merge. Right? But initially, and sometimes for a very long period of time, they stay separate. Allah says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَهُمَا He has made between them two. Barzakhan, a barrier. What is barzakh? Barzakh is bayna shay'ain. It is something which is between two things. Something that is between two things. Now when it is between two things, what is it? It's a barrier. This is barzakh. Wa hijran mahjura. Remember hijran mahjura? We learned earlier in Surah Al-Furqan. Prohibiting partition. Meaning there is a barrier between these two waters preventing the two waters from mixing together. From losing their respective identities. No, they stay separate. So what happens? Why is it that they do not mix? Because first of all, chemically they are different. Chemically they are different. They even have different densities. Right? Because salty water, it has more salt content. Obviously, what do you think it is? Heavier or lighter? Heavier. Where is it going to be? At the bottom. Right? And fresh water, where is that going to be? At the top. And you see this all over the world. In different parts. And sometimes you will even see the difference in the color. Even in the color. One is kind of blue, one is kind of green. And literally there is a line between them. There's a line between them. And notice the word Bahrain. Right? Two Bahr. Two huge bodies of water. It's not just a little bit. Some people misunderstand this ayah. They say the Quran says salty water and sweet water don't mix. Well, take some water, add salt to it, mix it. And then take some plain water and then mix the two together. What's going to happen? They will mix up. They say, oh, there's an open lie in the Quran. There's an evident lie in the Quran. This is not what the Quran is talking about. What is the Quran talking about? Bahrain. Huge, large bodies of water. Right? 
And this is something that's well known. That initially what happens, the two waters when they meet, they don't mix. They don't. They stay separate. And sometimes in the middle of the ocean, or rather at the bottom of the ocean, there will be sweet water springs. Sweet water coming out. Right? So who has done this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done this. Now, what do we learn from this? Now the surah is Furqan. Surah is Furqan. Sweet water remains sweet and salty water remains salty. Are they the same? No way. There is a huge difference between the two. Just like that, there is truth and there is also falsehood. Are they the same? No, they are not the same. So what does it mean then? We have to keep salty water salty and we have to keep sweet water sweet. Truth is truth, falsehood is falsehood. Even if people say it, that they're both the same, can they be the same? They cannot be the same. Now, what happens when sweet water enters salty water? It remains what it is. Right? Sweet water remains what it is. Fresh water remains what it is. It doesn't lose its color. It doesn't lose its properties. It remains what it is. What does this teach us then? That when we are in an environment that is bitter and salty, hmm? falsehood, that is not upon haq, what are we supposed to do? Lose our identity? No. Remain yourself. Be who you are. So this is something that we need to reflect on. That what do I become in a different environment? Do I retain my identity? Do I remain myself? Do I hold on to my moral standard of sabr or tolerance, a happy disposition, hmm? whatever it may be. And likewise, do I hold on to the book of Allah? Do I adhere to the truth in places where no one around me is adhering to the truth? It could be at home, it could be at school, it could be at work. Sometimes we're in a very bitter environment, so can we retain our sweetness despite the bitterness around us? Can we? Because we think it's impossible. What does this ayah show to us? It is possible. It is possible for you to remain who you are no matter where you are. Be yourself. You should know what you want to be. Be clear about who you are and be yourself wherever you go. Don't change yourself. The Prophet ﷺ is basically reassured in this ayah. Because in Makkah, was there a lot of hostility, a lot of opposition? A lot. The believers were very few in number. Hmm? And the sweet water was very little compared to the salt water. Just as when fresh water from a river enters into the ocean, it's very little compared to the massive ocean, isn't it? But what happens? The fresh water remains what it is. So in a way, the believers are being told, remain who you are. Be firm. And what do you have to do? Jahid hum bihi jihadan. Kabira, strive, exert effort, do whatever is within your capacity. Remain yourself, retain your identity. And what will happen? Allah will grant you success. And didn't it happen? Within 23 years, everything changed. And He is the one who, خلق, He has created, من الماء, from water, بشرًا, human being. Yes. Mm-hmm. Good question. Adab, same root as the word ad. Hmm? What's the connection? Ad, sweet water. Do you taste it in your mouth? Do you experience it? Do you feel it? You feel it in your mouth, you feel it in your throat, isn't it? Does it not take your thirst away? It does. So just like that, adab, Torture is something that is experienced. Don't think of it as something metaphorical. It's something that is experienced. It is real. Just as you taste water, you swallow it, it's real. It has an effect on you. Just like that, torture also affects. It's real. وَهُوَ الَّذِي And he is the one who خَلَقَ مِنَ الْمَاءِ بَشَرًا He has made from water human beings. What does it mean by that? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every living creature from what? From water. In the Quran we learn, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ 
We have created everything living from water. Meaning any living creature, its source is water. It doesn't mean that it should definitely have water inside of it. No, its origin, meaning when it was created, there was water there. Water was the origin. Right? So human beings also, their origin is what? Water. Now, ma can be understood as water, and it can also be understood as liquid. So it could refer to the liquid from which man is created. Right? Referring to the sperm and the egg. And in the previous ayah, by the way, what did we see? Water, is it all the same? No. Some water is salty, bitter, and some water is fresh and sweet. And this is why some people, they're naturally sweet, and some people, they're naturally otherwise. Huh? That doesn't mean that if we have a tendency to be bitter, we allow ourselves to be bitter. No. We just have to struggle a little bit more to be happy. Right? Likewise, a person who, who finds everything funny, right? Or he's relaxed in every situation, they need to neutralize a little bit also. Right? Because each person is tested even with their disposition. فَجَعَلَهُ So then he made him. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the human being, made for the human being, نَسَبًا Every human being, he is a relative by nasab wa and sihra, marriage. Meaning every single person is somehow related to you. Because you are related to other people either through blood or through marriage. What does it mean by this? Nasab. Nasab from the root letters nun seen ba, it refers to relationship by blood. And sihr, sadhara, it refers to relationships that come about through marriage. Also it is said that nasab, it refers to sons. Alright, sons. Because lineage continues through sons. Alright? And sihr refers to daughters. Why? Because you have in-laws through who? Daughters. You understand? Because a woman marries a man, and then what happens? She is now with him. His lineage is going to continue, but it doesn't mean that they're not connected to you at all. Alright? So, فَجَعَلَهُ نَسَبًا وَصِهْرًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the human being a relative by lineage and marriage. وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ قَدِيرًا And ever is your Lord competent. Meaning, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, He could have made each human being individually. Each human being, individual, meaning unrelated to other human beings. Was that possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, it was, because He is Qadir. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created human beings such that they're all related to each other. Right? They're all related to each other. How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create human beings? From Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam, Allah made him with his hands. Hmm? Then from Adam, Hawa was created. From Adam. I mean, if you think about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have created Hawa from, you know, by his own hands, meaning separately, without taking the source from Adam. Isn't it possible? It was possible for Allah, but Allah did not. He created Hawa from Adam. And then from the two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the rest of mankind. And through this, all people are related to each other. Isn't this amazing? All people are related to each other. وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ قَدِيرًا And is there a difference in this? I mean, if we were not related to each other, would that make us any different? Of course it would. What is it that naturally draws people together? What? Relationships. Whether they are through blood or through marriage, right? They bring us closer to each other. They force us to stay together. You have this feeling of responsibility, that I have to be there for my family, right? Even if someone is a distant relative, isn't it amazing how you will drive like six hours to go and meet them on Eid? Distant relative, who are they? Oh, my mother's cousins, you know, daughters, someone, right? Recently I met somebody who happens to be my cousin's husband's, yeah, cousin, right? So my cousin's husband's cousin, all right? 
And it felt so nice meeting them. First time ever. And I'm like, how are they even related to me? Such a long relationship. But, you know, you're like, you feel close to each other just because there is some connection. Right? And if we were not connected like this, then what would happen? I don't know you. You don't know me. I don't care if you fall. I don't care if you're standing in the sun. Right? What happens when strangers are in one place? There are 50 people standing in a place that's shady and a hundred people who are waiting for a spot somewhere in the shade, but nobody cares. Why? Because strangers. And the moment you spot someone you recognize, oh, come stand with me. Right? Come stand with me in the shade. You want a chair? Here, here, take mine. How we become more caring towards people that we know. And this is Allah's blessing. Right? So, فَجَعَلَهُ نَسَبًا وَصِحًا وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ قَدِيرًا But many times we take these relationships as a burden, as a problem. Oh, in-laws. Oh, cousins. Uncles and aunts. We take them as a burden. They're not a burden. They're a blessing. And remember that every blessing comes with its own set of trials and challenges. وَيَعْبُدُونَ And they worship. مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Besides Allah. مَا لَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ That which does not benefit them. وَلَا يَضُرُّهُمْ And that which does not harm them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created all of this. The shadow, the night, the day, sleep, everything. Over here relationships through blood, through marriage, all of this has been given to us by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet many people, what do they do? They leave Allah and they worship something that can neither benefit them nor harm them. وَكَانَ kafir And the disbeliever is ever عَلَى رَبِّهِ against his Lord ظَهِيرًا and assistant. ظَهِير from the root letters ظَهَرًا ظَهَر means back. Right? Now, long time ago, even today in fact, when people have to travel to far off places, right, and they have baggage with them, they have some stuff with them, what is it that they put it on? The backs of animals, right? So the dhahr, the back of the animal is like a help for you, because otherwise you would have to carry it on your own back. So from this, dhahra, also to help. Dhahir, one who helps. So the disbeliever is an assistant against his Lord, meaning the one who disbelieves in Allah is helping someone against Allah. Who is he helping against Allah? Shaytan. The one who disbelieves in Allah, the one who associates partners with Allah, the one who is ungrateful to Allah, he is helping Shaytan. He is working for the satanic mission. What is Shaytan's mission? To take people to hell. Right? To cause people to rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to see, who is it that I am helping? Who is it that I am supporting? Who is it that I am working for? One is jahid hum bihi jihadan kabira. Strive with the Qur'an. And the other is to assist the shaytan. When everything belongs to Allah, when Allah has created us, He owns us. We have to return to Him. Then why not surrender to Him? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ And we have not sent to you, O Prophet wasallam, إِلَّا except مُبَشِّرًا As a bringer of good news, وَنَذِيرًا And as a warner. Because the Prophet wasallam, he could only convey, right? Could he force people? Could he? No, he couldn't. So what was his responsibility? Be a mubashir and be a nadir. Who is mubashir? One who gives good news. And who is nadir? One who warns. So when you're convincing somebody to do something, what do you do? What do you do? You tell them the benefits of doing it. That is what? Being a mubashir. Right? And at the same time, you're warning them that if you don't do it, you'll suffer from such and such consequences. Isn't it? Many times it happens, you go to a store and you're, for the fifth or sixth time you're asked, do you have this particular card? And you're like, no thank you. Yeah, but if you sign up today, you'll get this box of cookies. Like, no, I already have five box of cookies in my grocery cart. Don't you see that? You're offering me one box only? For example, right? But they give you incentives. This is Bashara, good news. You do this, and this is the benefit that you'll get. Right? Nadira. But the responsibility of the Prophet ﷺ was only to convey. In Surah Al-Ahzab 45 also we learn, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيْكِ إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمُبَشِّرًا 
wa nadira o prophet we have sent you as a witness as a bringer of good news and as a warner qul say ma not as'alukum i ask you alayhi for it min ajr any payment meaning for conveying this message to you for conveying this warning for delivering this good news i'm not expecting anything in return from you i don't want to be paid you don't need to give me anything illa except meaning there's one thing that i do expect from you and what is that man sha'a whoever wants an yattakhidha that he should take ila rabbih to his lord sabila away this is the compensation this is the wage of the prophet that people are connected to their lord and this should be the compensation that we should be aiming towards also whenever we tell anybody something about the quran something about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything of the deen what is it that our goal should be that this person gets connected with his lord he discovers his lord he finds out who his lord is he begins to love allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if a person really loves allah because of what you've told him then yes you have won then yes you are going to get the greatest rewards inshallah from allah azza wa jal so illa man sha'a an yattakhidha ila rabbih sabila this is the greatest compensation that a person can get وَتَوَكَّلْ And rely upon. عَلَى Upon الْحَيْ The living, the ever-living. Meaning, this work is not going to be easy. When you're telling people to change their very beliefs, when you're telling people to change the way they live, their lifestyle, is it going to be easy? No way. So who is it that you rely upon? Who is it that you trust on? Allah Azza wa Jal. And who is He? Al-Hay, the ever-living, al-ladhi la yamut, the one who does not die. And this is so beautiful. That is mentioned over here. Al-ladhi la yamut. Many times what happens? Let me tell you, because I'm a woman. Many times as women, you know, when we're not married, who is it that we rely upon? Our parents. Right? After marriage, the husband. Once children come in, and the husband gets too busy with everything else then what happens it's the children right but can these people die can they die yes can you stop them from dying you cannot can you save them from dying not at all who is it that never dies allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so trust on him rely on him when you need something when you need an answer when you don't know what to do when you're confused don't look at your parents my mother will tell me my father will tell me my husband will help me yes they are means yes inshallah they will be helpful but the real solution will come from who al hayy alladhi la yamut the living one who does not die depend on him and seek help from him seek answers from him seek solutions from him because allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayy قيوم لا تاخذه سنه ولا نوم الله does not even sleep he is not even overcome by sleepiness what happens to people do they fall asleep when you really want to talk to them do they all day you're waiting the children will sleep i'll talk to my husband right and what happens he falls asleep he falls asleep then what are you supposed to do you want to talk to somebody but they live in a different country different time zone which means that when you're awake they're sleeping right and when they're awake you're sleeping what are you meant to do istikhara 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 right seek allah's help recently there was a particular issue that i needed to discuss with my mother right and because my mother is in a different country traveling recently I was finding it so difficult because every time i'd want to talk to her she was busy or when she would message me i would miss her call or something And then finally I messaged her and she said do istikhara. I'm like yeah but this and this and she's like do istikhara. Right? You know this is something that we really need to remind ourselves of. Wa tawakkal 'ala al-hayy alladhi la yamut. Wa sabbih bihamdihi. And exalt him with his praise, meaning do such tasbih that has praise in it. So for example, subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Huh? Subhanallah al-Azim wa bihamdihi. There's different tasbihat with praise, with hamd. Because tasbih really it it calms your heart. 
It calms your heart, takes away your fears, gives you confidence. وَكَفَى And sufficient. بِهِ With it. بِذُنُوبِ With the sins, plural of them. عِبَادِهِ Of his servants. Kafa bihi bihi with him meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bidunubi ibadihi khabira fully aware meaning Allah is fully aware of the sins of his servants he knows what his servants are doing so leave their matter to him because sometimes we're so concerned about the wrong that other people are doing the sins that they're committing hmm? that we get caught up in the faults of others and we stop worrying about ourselves So leave their sins to Allah to judge. Right? He will judge. He will decide. What my problem is, meaning what I need to worry about, I need to work on that. And for that, I have to seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Muzzammil, Ayah 9, also we learn, رَبُّ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ فَاتَّخِذْهُ وَكِيلَ He is the Lord of the East and the West. There is no God but Him. So take Him as a wakil, disposer of affairs. Rely upon Him. هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم in Surah Al-Hadid Ayah 3 that he is the first, the last, the ظاهر, the apparent, al-batin, the intimate and he is knowing of everything who is he? الذي خلق السماوات والأرض he is the one who has created the skies and the earth وما بينهما and whatever that is between them both in how long? في ستة أيام in six days In six days, Allah created the skies and the earth and whatever is in between. And for this, I would recommend that you all watch these uh, short videos by Sheikh Umar Sulaiman, The Beginning and the End. Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya. In which he explains about how the creation was originated and it's beautiful. It's very, very necessary, I believe, for us to especially learn about these matters. So, How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the skies and the earth in six days, He is best aware of that. But what this shows is, first of all, Allah's ability. That how there was nothing. And He brought all of this out of nothing. In how long? Six time periods? I mean, just the number six is not a huge number. It's not a huge figure. However long these ayam were, Allah knows best. But the fact that there were only six stages or six days, six time periods, whatever it was, it shows Allah's ability, His qudra. And why is this being mentioned over here? Trust on Him. Rely on Him. Seek answers from Him. فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ Then He rose above the throne. How? In a manner that befits him. Who is he? Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Fas'al, so ask, bihi about him. Khabira, one who is well informed. Meaning if you want to know about Allah, who is he? Who is he? Where is he? How is he? What are his attributes? What does he say? What has he commanded? Then don't just use your imagination. Don't just use your own Mind, what is it that you need to do? Ask someone who is aware. You understand? Like for example, I asked you a question, what is shadow? You tried using your mind, but you couldn't come up with a clear definition, could you? What do you need to do then? Ask someone who knows. Isn't it? So likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, who is God? Can we just rely upon our own mind to discover God? No, we cannot. If we do that, our understanding will be faulty. It will be wrong. What is it that we need to do? Ask those who know. Who knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who? Allah, of course, He is most knowing of Himself, right? So then we need to see who is it that Allah has informed. The Prophet, right? So we see what Allah has revealed. We see the Qur'an. And we see what the Prophet ﷺ has taught us about Allah, about Allah's names and attributes. فَاسْأَلْ بِهِ خَبِيرًا Someone who will inform you about Allah's attributes. And notice how the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, is mentioned over here. Why Ar-Rahman? Because, وَإِذَا and when, قِيلَ لَهُمْ It is said to them, أُسْجُدُوا Rahman, Prostrate to the Most Merciful. قَالُوا They say, وَمَا Rahman? Who is, what is Ar-Rahman? What is Ar-Rahman? We don't know Ar-Rahman. 
Anas judu, shall we prostrate lima for that which the muruna you order us? Wazadahum, and it increases them nufura in aversion. The people of Makkah are being mentioned. They only recognized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the name Allah. Alright? And the Prophet sallallahu when he recited the Quran to them, he said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Bismillah, Allah, okay, they knew Ar Rahman. They said, What is Ar Rahman? What is Ar Rahim? We don't know Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And this is why when Surah Hudaybiyah was being written, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim was written, what did they say? They said, We don't know Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Change this. Remove this and instead write, Bismikallahum. Hmm? Write the name that we recognize. They had the Prophet ﷺ remove the names Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. But if you look at the meaning of Ar-Rahman, what does Ar-Rahman mean? The one who is most merciful. Right? He is most, no one is more merciful than him. And if you look at the beginning of the Quran, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, What's next? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And notice it's not just Ar-Rahman, but with Ar-Rahman also, Ar-Rahim, to emphasize mercy. So when they're told, prostrate to the merciful, merciful Lord, what do they say? Oh, what is this merciful Lord? We're not going to prostrate to Him. And this name, it increases them in aversion. And this shows their blind hatred towards the Qur'an. Because if they really looked at it openly, they would have found this message to be beautiful. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي Blessed is the one who جَعَلَ فِي السَّمَاءِ Who has made in the sky بُرُوجًا Great stars. This is a plural of بُرْج بَرَجِين بُرْج And what does بُرْج mean? Fortified towers. Huge towers, castles that can be seen from far. Right? A tower that can be seen from far. And it is so strong, and it is so tall, that it is impossible to, to climb it, to reach it, to overcome it. Alright? This is Burj. And what does the Buruj in the sky refer to? Buruj in the sky. The one who has made in the sky Buruj. It refers to stars. Huge stars. Because they're way out of reach. Aren't they? Can we try to reach them? Maybe the moon we can reach, but beyond that, it's... We're trying to reach different planets. We've just caught, you know, glimpses of them, but it's a big endeavor. Isn't it? And the stars which are even further away, impossible to reach. So Allah has made in the sky buruj, stars. Alright? And buruj, burj, is also used for manzil. What is manzil? A position. A position. A certain location. Now, buruj refers to the stars in the sky, which take certain positions. And as the night goes on, these stars, they move. Right? The moon also, it moves. And because of this movement, or because of their position, we're able to make sense of time. I mean, these days we just use our watches. Correct? But before, when these watches didn't exist, how is it that people could tell time in the middle of the night? With what? The position of the stars. Did you know that? During the day, how do you tell time? Through the shadow. Right? The position of the sun. In the night, it's the position of the stars. So blessed is the one who has placed in the sky great stars. وَجَعَلَ fiha, And he has made in it سِرَاجًا A burning lamp. What is this burning lamp referring to? The sun. سِرَاج سِينَ رَاجِيم is referred to that which is set alight by oil or some other fuel. So it gives light and it also gives heat. And this is what the sun is. Right? It gives light and it also gives heat. It's the source of light in our universe. Or rather in our galaxy as we see. Right? وَقَمَرَ munira, And he is also placed in the sky, قَمَر, the moon, which is munir, that is radiant. That, that shines nur. That gives off nur. Which nur? Its own nur? No, the nur of the sun. وَهُوَ الَّذِي And he is the one who جَعْلَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ Who has made the night and the day خِلْفَةً in succession خَالَامْفَ خِلْفَ خِلْفَ خَلْف That which is behind خِلْفَ is that which follows something and replaces it. Meaning one goes, so the other comes after it and takes its place. So the night and the day, they are in خِلْفَ What does it mean by that? The night goes and what comes? The day. The day goes and what comes? The night. In constant succession, in constant 
rotation. Alright? Liman, for the one who arada, he intended. And yadhakara, that he should remember. Meaning this constant rotation of the night and the day. Why is it like that? So that we have some sense of time. And with this time, what happens? We remember things. Liman arada an yadhakara. Many times it happens that we want to do something during the day. But as the day comes to an end, the night begins, what do we say? Oh, let me do it before I sleep. Isn't it? So the coming of the night reminds you that you have to do something before you sleep. You have to accomplish something, you have to finish something before you sleep. So the night and the day, two distinct times. Why so? What's the benefit? So that if we're not able to do something during the day, we take advantage of the night. If we're not able to do something in the night, we take advantage of the day. لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَذَّكَّرَ أَوْ أَرَادَ شُكُورًا Or the one who intends gratitude. Meaning someone who wants to be grateful, the night and the day are enough reasons to make him grateful. Meaning as the day comes, as the day comes to an end, the night begins, the night ends, this changing, what should it produce in us? Gratitude. That Alhamdulillah, the long, tiring, difficult day is over. Alhamdulillah, I get to rest. I get to take a break from my problems. Right? Or Alhamdulillah, now I can do my work. So, لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَذَّكَّرَ أَوْ أَرَادَ شُكُورًا So, what is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is mentioned over here? The alternation of the night and the day. What's their purpose? First of all, remember. Remember what you've forgotten. Take advantage of your time. Take a lesson. And secondly, be grateful. And especially these times, meaning when, when the day comes to an end, the night begins. Or the other way around, when the night comes to an end and the day begins. These are the times when we especially show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what? For another chance. This is why we have the morning adhkar, we have the evening adhkar. Glorify Allah and thank Allah for another, for another day, for another night. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to benefit from our days and nights and not just let them go by. It's already August 2nd, right? We've reached the last part of our summer break. Those of you who were having their summer break, each day, each night is a time to take advantage of. It's not a time to just pass, to kill. Because time is precious.